Hello again, guys. This is uh, Melanie still from 3D Natives, and welcome again to this new presentation uh, where we will see how Paragon enable the mass production of 3D printed wagon models for rails of shield weight with the digital light synthesis technology like carbon. Hi, Roy. Hi. How, I'm fine, and you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Great. So I'm here today with Roy Crombie, who's the DLS manager of Paragon Rapid Technologies. Um, feel free to ask him some questions uh, in the Q&A still. Um, I'll give a brief uh, introduction and then leave you the, the stage, Roy. So Roy Crombie spent 20 years in injection molding. Uh, he gained experience as an operator, material handler, metrology technician, quality engineer, project engineer, and project manager. Driven to stay on the cutting edge of new technology, he moved to Paragon, which offered a very new challenge. Moving from mass production to one-off prototyping and low-volume production was a huge shift in focus. He now leads in developing the adoption of DLS technology, has a department with a great number of low-volume opportunities across a range of industries. So, Roy, uh, the stage is yours. I can see you already shared your screen. That's perfect. Yeah. And I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Brilliant. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, and uh, hats off to everyone who's managed to stay up for the entire event as well. Um, I have to confess that I did have a little bit of a sleep in the middle. Um, but happy to be here and, and share our story. Um, so. I could probably skip past the um, the first sequence here, which is basically a brief background to myself, and that has already been covered. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of a background on Paragon and what, what we do as a company. So Paragon traditionally was um, a 3D printing company doing low volume production um, from you know volumes as, as slow as one-off up to um, low tens into um, early twenties of, of product across um, 3D print, um, vacuum casting and rim casting, um, and CNC machining. Um, so a range of industries uh, is is infinite. Um, we'll work with entrepreneurs and um, inventors right the way through to your uh, large OEMs. Um, it's a little unique this project that we picked up with rails um, so when we first discussed this with rails there was a very set um, criteria which they needed to achieve um, it wasn't in any way an easy product to produce and certainly there were a lot of uh, people who looked at this and um, felt like it was something that we should probably walk away from and that wasn't necessarily achievable um, when we discussed with Rails from the very outset, uh, the biggest and main factor that they wanted to achieve uh, was cost. <laughs> um, and whilst this is always a, an end goal for any company, um, with Rails it was more prevalent. Uh, so if you look to the, the slide to the left there, and um, you can see that an, a normal project in, in everyday life would run with uh, your initial concept um, that would be given to us and the with a, a set amount of criteria which is our goal uh, and then Paragon as a company would address the feasibility of producing those parts um, and from that the methodology so that might be that we recommend 3d print it might be that we think that 3d prints not acceptable whether that's because of material properties or uh, what you want to achieve with your product um, so we might choose vacuum casting or rim casting. Indeed, if it's traditionally a, produ a production intent part, um, then we would maybe have opted for CNC machining. Or we would have taken it through the prototype stage uh, and then handed it over to an injection molding company um, to take it onto that higher volume. Cost and lead time were almost the last thing that would be discussed. Um, you know, once all of that concept is addressed and um, then you submit your quotations and achievable lead times and then you discuss whether it's feasible to move forward with that project with rails that was off the table from day one 
um, they had a very um, strict cost that they needed to achieve. The reason for this is that the product that Rails produces um, are effectively model trains uh, and the, um, all of the paraphernalia that goes along with that. So their cost base was already set. They knew that above a certain parameter, um, they wouldn't be able to compete with the likes of Hornby um, and Bachman, who uh, produce um, hobby trains on uh, at mass volume. So we were under no illusion from the start that if we wanted to win this contract, yes, we had to achieve cost first and foremost, um, but then we had to tick all of the boxes on everything else that would have gone along with a normal project as well. So the, this slide, um, it's basically to show the, you know, the, the main selling points of the DLS technology and why we, um, from the outset, recognized that only DLS would be able to give us what we wanted to achieve. Um, I've highlighted the two most, uh, effectively, the, the most important factors there. Uh, the first one was that DLS uh, as a process is um, far, far, far faster than traditional 3D printing methods. So far faster than um, your SLS and SLA, which we have in-house, um, and uh, certainly far faster than most of the traditional um, printing methods as well. The other deciding factor for this was the ability to utilize the technology for um, producing different versions of the same thing. So when I say that, what I mean is small batch run production where we can tweak and change the parameters to produce um, a slightly different version of the same product without having to do two changes. Uh, this is twofold. It's obviously a, a huge cost saving, um, but it's also a huge, huge time saving as well. So some of the subtle changes that um, Rails wanted to achieve were to incorporate slightly different design versions of the same thing, much more like it is in real life. So if you have um, a train on a track um, and you've got another train um, carriage behind the first one, no two are alike. Um, and you know, for the for the era that this all depicts, um, you you might have a, a carriage full of trains that had thirty carriages behind um, behind the the coach, and each one of them was very slightly different. That's not to say that we print each one exactly um, individually, um, but what it allowed um, us to do was build up a database of components um, which people could purchase one of. So you could buy one of each version and then create what is effectively a more realistic, um, a more realistic um, train set going forward. If you bought a, a Hornby um, version, for instance, um, because of the tooling restrictions, the Hornby versions would very much be the same entity over and over again. Uh, and what you would have there is a situation where the model maker would actually then uh, individually break down each unit, um, refashion it himself uh, through traditional model making techniques, put it back together and effectively create his own different versions of the same thing. So the, the concept was obviously to achieve the piece part cost within 15% of a, of a standard molded product. So they weren't expecting us to um, meet the cost head on but they had a very small margin of what they could go above um, the traditional costing. We had to be able to print multiple versions of the same wagon. Um, and again, that had to be without incurring any further cost. So if we go and again look at injection molding, if you want to change a tool, then you have to pay for that change and you have to live with the lead time associated with that as well. And um, not only that, but just to, um, really, really mix it up and make it difficult for us. Uh, they wanted to for um, us to exceed quality and the level of detail that can be achieved with a standard injection mode. So our um, first print um, has features which are not possible to injection mode. And this is where 3D printing comes into its own. And um, there's no constraints on draft angles. 
there's no constraints with undercuts um, and to a degree you can pretty much 3d print anything um, what we had to be careful about was where components were supported obviously during the build process um, and the parameters that, that go along with that um, but inevitably um, if we could achieve a, a, a part which was pretty much support free so the level of labor we could put into that then that brought our cost and base um, right down so they also wanted to print in small batch numbers but in short lead times and again it's two boxes that 3d printing ticks um, the small batch numbers originally was because they didn't know how this product was going to sell they didn't know if we could achieve what they wanted us to achieve um, and for that reason they didn't want to run thousands of parts that effectively would be on a shelf forever uh, and the reason for the short lead times was inevitably because once they shelf, um, if it did go past the demand that they wanted to um, they thought was the potential for the product then they wanted to be able to back it up with more product in a, in a short space, space of time um, and then I've heard um, questions relating to um, the, the the repetitive and the standards that you can maintain in 3D printing, and that was a, a very big question of Rails as well. It was how can we produce one part um, that looks exactly like the next part over and over again, over a period of time, um, and then if we drop away from that part and then want to produce the same part again in three years' time, can we maintain that same standard again? Uh, and this again led us to the Carbon um, setup. Carbon's software is, uh, certainly from my experience, unique in its traceability. Um, it allows us to almost um, fine tune the process down to the, the machine, the uh, print bed that we use, the lens that we use to um, create uh, the, the parts from and also the, obviously the, the resins that we then put onto the machines as well. And we can make that as tunable as we, we like. So if it's a, a non-standard product that doesn't have um, intense quality aspirations, then we could run it across all of the machines on all of the apparatus in, in a range of materials. If we wanted to hone that into a specific material on a specific machine to get absolute repeatability, we can do that. And we can, and the machines will um, flag up uh, from a quality point of view if we're not doing that, and people are trying to um, supersede the process or you know um, shortcut the process. So it 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 all led us to carbon. It all led us to DLS, and it, it um, gave us um, a, a very narrow mindset of what we wanted to um, what we wanted to achieve. So Rails had dabbled with 3D printing in the past, so it wasn't something that was entirely new to them. Um, but what they'd found is that, as I've just said, the repeatability and the quality levels that were achievable at the time uh, were just um, you know, not feasible. It didn't give them a product that they felt they could take to the market and that would be accepted and would sell. Um, so from a Paragon point of view, we couldn't achieve the cost parameter that they want to um, us to achieve. Um, again, this comes down to um, a prototyping mindset, and it it basically revolves around the level of it, the the level of time that you spend the on the machine, um, and the level of time that you can have a machine printing, um, and the level of time that you have to put into then. Um, working the part and getting them to uh, the end level. So with, with that in mind, we basically reverse engineered the whole process and looked first at how we can achieve the cost. Um, the only way that we could feasibly achieve the cost was to take Paragon's running parameters and elongate them. When I say that, I mean that we effectively had to um, change a business from what was an eight-hour running platform um, and increase that ideally to 24 and um, but in the first instance up to 16. so what that enabled us to do was to reduce the overhead um, and 
run the parts over a longer period of time, which in itself creates a shorter lead time. So in the process of doing that, what we found was we could take cost out of the process. Um, working with Carbon um, and the, the UK-based team, and I, I need to give a shout out to Scott Riley, who was instrumental in then processing the, um, the adopted CAD uh, and tuning that so that we got the absolute best um, utilization from the machines. So again, it goes to um, back to a prototyping method where you might only run one part. If you run one part, um, but have to use a set amount of resin, then it's, it's very expensive. It's an expensive process to do. Um, what we needed to do and what the carbon machines allowed us to do was to hone the process to maximize the build speed by fine tuning um, the build parameters. So you can tune the speed up and down depending on what area of the, the um, build process it is at. And then the other aspect was to maximize the amount of parts we could fit on a build platform. Now that, that meant that we ended up splitting the, the um, component parts down into three sections, uh, a carriage, a chassis, and a roof. Uh, the roof we built upright or uh, as near to so that we could fit more, more roofs on a build at any given time. Um, the carriage to achieve the, the level of detail we wanted to achieve uh, we built virtually flat. Um, so this limited the amount of parts we could get on a build. Uh, the chassis, we actually found um, it feasible to build at 45 degrees, and this helped us in two aspects. One was the minimization of the support structures um, because we were effectively lowering the, the build angle, um, but also maximized the amount of parts that we could fit on a build platform. So all of that rolled in uh, give us a, a cost parameter that was much closer. So, you know, elongating the um, the, the time that Paragon ran the um, print, prints over uh, by utilizing the machines more, um, honing the process to achieve faster build times, and then working with um, Carbon to uh, achieve what was, in effect, the most utilization that we could get from one build platform. And when we did that, we then looked at um, the, 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 the cost parameter that we could achieve and all the amount of parts that we needed to produce to achieve that. So when I say that, um, if you go, again go back to injection molding, with injection molding, if you want to run 10,000 parts and your tooling cost is 10,000 pounds, you, you know, it's not rocket science to know that you to recoup the cost of the tool you incorporate um, the tool cost into the part price and and that gives you a, a starting point to recoup any investment. Um, with DLS and with 3D print, we don't have that tooling cost. So we're already at almost ground zero. Um, with any uh, lead work that goes into the process, um, it's more hours of, you know, it's labor hours of people's time. Um, so we could establish at what point we could get to um, on before it became less cost effective. The, the magic number that we came up with was 600 units. So at 600 units, um, maximizing the build process uh, and the length of time we had to build parts, the cost reduction didn't really um, reduce any further. So we knew that we had a cost there that we weren't going to get below. Um, and that was the point where we went to Rails and said, right, how does this cost look against what you feasibly think you can charge? And it, it was close enough that Rails were willing to take that leap of faith um, and, and go to our first print. Um, so, we, we set off with an initial batch run of 200 parts. And the reason for the 200 part number uh, was predominantly because it allowed us to test uh, the ongoing methodology, i.e. it allowed us to test the, uh, the, the build parameters over a couple of day period so that we could establish if it was a process that was manageable. Um, we hadn't done anything on this volume prior to that. 
uh, it had all been very much lower volume batch batch production runs um, so this was really a test of how accurate the machines were how reliable they were and how repeatable they would allow us to be um, and we weren't disappointed um, we we ran through the first 200 without any issues um, inevitably a couple of scrap parts um, in the initial process stages uh, but once we ironed out those little glitches it ran very smoothly um, so rails basically then um, launched the product at um, the um, the york um, show so at the york show um, it, it's one of the biggest shows in the uk outside of london and um, there are a lot of uh, competitors to rails there there were um, a lot of your traditional modern makers who would inevitably scrutinize these um, components um, and the, the plaudits were um, blown away um, so the the regular magazines um, and usual uh, you know critics of um, any product when it's first launched um, were suitably impressed with what we'd achieved um, and inevitably that led to questions about where the relationship would go and how soon we would be looking to um, the next versions so with that in mind um, we then went back to rails and said right the only way that we can now um, look at the the long the longevity of this process is if we get commitment from yourselves um, to to not only build over 600 parts or a thousand parts or one process uh, sorry one component but how can we get to a point where you can guarantee us work um, for a number of years because that was the only way that we were going to have confidence that this process would be scalable to um, to a, a mass production market um, rails thankfully um, agreed to then um, a two-year contract with us to produce um, 20, around 20 units um, with an ongoing production cycle um, of roughly one new version per month. Um, so we've to date uh, launched three units and uh, in the interest of Blue Peter, if anybody's familiar with Blue Peter, he's one I produced earlier. Um, so if you can see this what we've got here are the three current versions of the trends um, the first one uh, in the primer gray here this is where we started so you can see it's got the flat roof um, it has the wooden doors and then on the chassis we've got a, a brake lever uh, on the second version you can see we have these uh, vents to the top so a very subtle change um, but it goes down to how you can make these subtle sort of changes um, and then repeat the process without having to incur tooling costs. Um, also, under the third unit, you can see that we changed from a wooden door here um, to a, a metal door. Sorry if the, the images are not very clear. You can see them to the left-hand side of the slide as well. Um, again, a subtle change, um, but a change that was met with, with you know, good reception by the critics and um, the sales have um, exceeded expectation so COVID's put a little bit of a, um, a, a thrown a little bit of a curveball into that um, the guys that actually print these parts a company called Dapol um, they, they they're currently on shutdown so number four I'm afraid is a secret um, but there is a fourth version coming it'll launch uh, as soon as things return back to some kind of normality um, so that's the end of that. If you've got any questions, I'd be um, more than happy to to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you all for this um, nice presentation. I was going to think no more about the rail industry. Um, we have a few questions. Um, first one, if you consider buying the DLS uh and appreciate them rather than losing them? Um, so the easy answer to that is we can't buy DLS machines. Um, <laughs> if if Carbon are listening, um, they might be able to answer that particular question. Um, at the moment, the lease option is the only option available um, to us. 
Okay. Um, so, given the duration of the program with Rails, do you foresee any challenges uh, with machine and software improvements and the effects on your program? Um, so, not problems. Um, if anything, what Carbon are, are, are achieving um, from a, not only from a parameters point of view on the machines, but also with um, new materials, is making it a little bit easier for us. Um, so, as part of our um, as part of our deal with Carbon, we get software updates. Uh, we get access to all of the new materials, uh, and that really is all geared to make it, if like I say, if anything, things easier for us rather than more difficult. Okay. Um, another question is: Do you use any specific mathematics modeling system to find the optimal equation for product uh, production management? Sorry. Yeah, we have our own internal um, cost calculator, which gives us um, a, a low down on the cost on any particular product. Um, what we found very early was that our original cost model um, for what we would class as prototyping didn't fit with carbon. Um, it didn't fit with mass production. So what we did was we produced almost a different version of that, um, but it allows us to look at much higher volumes uh, and and then tune the parameters to to basically make it more cost effective. Like any um, mass produced activity, there's inevitably a cost down associated with that. We were never going to achieve the same kind of margins um, as we would with prototyping um, in in a mass production environment. Um, there's n uh, n no greater example than that than in the automotive sector. Uh, where year-on-year -year cost downs are, you know, part of the cost, really. So we, we understood that uh, cost reduction was uh, really, really important in that project. Um, how did you manage to reduce uh, the post processing steps, uh, you know, in order to, to reduce that cost at the end of the day? Yeah, it was twofold. Um, so we worked directly with Carbon. We get um, incredible support from them. Uh, and what we did was we worked with them by submitting them the CAD, and they can then work through the build parameters um, by processing the, the differential speeds that they can achieve. So one was to speed up the actual build process whilst not detracting from the quality that we wanted to achieve. Um, and then the, the second thing that we had to incorporate was really um, from a, our own point of view, was to look at the utilization of the machines over a greater period of time. Um, once we'd ironed that out, um, we then worked again with Carbon to get the setup um, exactly right, so that the um, amount of support we were using was at an absolute minimal. So on two of the parts, all of the supports are hidden on internal features. So they are either on the underside of the roof or the top of the chassis. So when you put the entire assembly together, uh, they're completely hidden. Um, so there's very little labor needed uh, to clean them off because once these, the product's assembled, you don't see it anywhere. Um, on the carriage, the only support structure that was visible uh, were to the, the very bottom of the, the carriage. Um, and that's, it's probably a, a minute um, of somebody's time to remove and clean that area up. So it's absolutely very minimal labor, which again helped us to keep that piece part cost to an absolute minimum. Okay, thank you so much, Roy. I see uh, it's time for, for us to go for the next uh, network no session, uh, but we can find you on the fourth floor, if I'm correct. Uh, table absolutely. Number nine. So I'll make sure that we see you there. Thank very you. Very good, thank you for having me. Cheers, bye, bye now, bye.